Digital and online tools can really enhance in-person environments. What am I talking about? That's what we're talking about today. Are you ready? Because it's time. You're listening to the Church Digital Sidekick Podcast, part of the TCD Podcast Network. Hey heroes, my name is Tom Pounder and this is the Church Digital Sidekick Podcast. This is the podcast where I bring on ministry leaders and we talk about how you can do digital ministry more effectively in this very digital and online world. And today I've got my friend Jake McNamara uh, back on the podcast. Jake is a great minister. He does a little bit of online. He does campus pastor stuff, which we'll get into in the interview. I don't want to <laughs> spoil any of it. But he's up in the Chicago area and he's been doing ministry for a really long time. So today we talk about how they had a campaign right around the Super Bowl that was enhanced by digital elements. What did that look like? How did it go? What were some of the learning things and how did they what were some of the victories? That's what we talk about today. I'm really excited to hear from him. He's got such a great perspective on digital ministry and in-person ministry. But before we get into that, I want to highlight the church digital. At the church.digital, that's the website. We've got tons of blogs, podcasts, coaches, and cohorts going on. There's a lot of exciting stuff happening at the Church Digital right now, all designed to help you in your online ministry. So if you've never checked out the Church Digital, go to it today. I've got links to it in the show notes. All right, so without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Jake McNamara. All right, with me right now is my friend Jake McNamara. Jake, how are you? Doing great, Tom. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. You know, we were just talking. He's in the Chicago area. I'm in the D.C. area. But we're both experiencing warmer weather right now as the, you know, the spring weather is getting into flux. What What is spring like with you guys up there where you're at? Uh, the typical Chicago answer is give it five minutes and it'll change. So <laughs> give it five minutes and it'll change this weekend. Gorgeous. Today, not so much. Yeah. Uh, that's good. That's good. Okay, so when this podcast airs, um, I think the 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 NFL draft will be right upon us. So, um, what you, the Bears have the number one pick? I know you're a big Bears fan. What's going to happen? Caleb Williams is the easy answer, uh, okay. and to me, the fun starts with the ninth pick of the draft for the Bears and what in the world they're going to do there. But <laughs> I think this will live well. Caleb Williams will be the new starting quarterback for the Chicago Bears. And I love it. I love it. Are you, okay, so are the Bears your favorite team? Uh, So the Cubs would be like my favorite sports team, but football, yeah, Bears without question. Okay, cool. And how do you feel like the Cubs are going to do this year? So they've been overperforming to date, which I love. Uh, Bullpen and starting rotation a little rocky. If that smooths out, then, I mean, playoff caliber team uh not world championship team but anything can happen in the postseason hey they don't need to win a world championship for another few decades after they won you know years ago so i'm greedy you know one just isn't quite enough yeah well see for me as a as a washington nationals fan i everyone's so upset still that we're not quite good enough like we're, we're still not rebuilding mode they've got pieces in place but we're still rebuilding um, not even a playoff team where that rebuilding, but I still keep on going 2019. I'm so happy still from 2019 that we won the world series. I'm good, man. I'm good. Yeah. I got to go three years farther back. So I'm still mostly good, but I'd love to update that. Yeah. See, that's good. Okay. Well, people are probably not listening to the podcast today to hear Jake and I talk about sports, but I do like to talk to him about sports because I do know he's a big Chicago guy and I believe a university of Michigan guy too, right? Uh, a fan of yep yep sad harbaugh gone but again we'll leave that to the side yeah we'll leave that to the side well jake tell people you've been on my podcast a a few different times but in case someone hasn't heard you on my podcast or don't know who you are tell people who you are and what you do yeah jake mcnamara i work at the compass church in the western western suburbs of chicago uh we are a six campus multi-site church um And I have helped historically with a lot of different things, including helping with our online ministry um, and running a a campus down in Plainfield, Illinois. So you're currently running the campus right now? Correct. Yep. And what's your involvement with online now? Because again, I know that you were heavily involved for a number of years, but are you still pretty involved there? Still pretty involved, but we've moved to a load share scenario, which we could get into at some point in time, but uh, more cooks in the kitchen, which helps get a few more things done, just a little harder to navigate. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. What do you like being about, what, what do you like most about being a campus pastor? Oh, uh, the best and the worst parts of a campus pastor are the people, right? Like, in <laughs> uh, full disclosure, like I love the staff that I get to work with. I mean, huge bright spot. I couldn't speak highly enough of all of them. Yeah. Well, that's good. Okay. So, well, here's the deal. You've got a lot of online experience and now you have a lot, you also have a lot of in-person experience as well. And while we were talking about different topics we could talk about today, you you shared something with me that I thought was really interesting. Now, you tried to downplay it saying, oh, it's not rocket science. Not a, a lot of churches are probably doing it, but I'm like, no, we need to share this encouragement. So recently at your church, um, and uh, you can tell me if it was all campuses or if it was just one campus, but recently at your church, you used digital to really support an initiative that your church was doing. So talk to me a little bit about that. Give me a general overview about what the campaign was, and then we'll get into how you use digital. Yeah, so we tapped into this little thing called He Gets Us. Uh, some people love, some people hate, some people just didn't fully understand. Uh, and this isn't <laughs> that conversation. But we realized that going into the Super Bowl, that there was going to be a lot of conversation around these commercials that happened. Um, and we wanted to use that to promote a value. So every year at our church, all of our campuses, we will promote a particular value that we want to push throughout the course of a whole year. Uh, and we felt very strongly that we wanted to work on relational evangelism. So not just the going out and sharing the gospel from a street corner, but how are we intentionally building friendships, using our friendships as a way to turn into faith conversations, and to realize that every single one of us can actually do that and do it pretty well. Um, so we decided that we were going to uh, do a training series in the fall and then use that as kind of a jumping off point to gear people up for this He Gets Us series that we started the first Sunday after the Super Bowl. Uh, so we wanted to capitalize on the millions of dollars that other people were spending yeah. and use it as a way to talk through some very real life practical conversations. Uh, things about the fact that Jesus understands our anxiety and our guilt. He understands what it's like to have dissatisfaction. He taught on those things. He felt many of those things. And we used it as a way, just so everybody can get it out of the way as well, to give a full picture of Jesus. Uh, so we, we worked through all of that. And it just, it was a lot of work, but a lot of fun. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I, I love that you attach it to the He Gets Us campaign because, again, you, you kind of talked about it earlier. You know, some people liked it. Some people hated it. The reality is it got us talking about Jesus. And yes. and that's you can that's free kit marketing right there. I mean, for every church, that's free marketing. You get to talk about Jesus. Um, so talk to me a little bit about this training that you did leading up to it. What, what were you training your people about, with? Yeah, so we did a sermon series called The Table. Uh, so what we did is we took four weeks to look at the different dinner parties that Jesus had uh, as a way to get people to ultimately host their own dinner parties. We did that in the lead up to Thanksgiving with the hopes that people would be able to work in faith conversations uh, into their Thanksgiving dinner. And then we took kind of that period in between Thanksgiving and the start of this series uh, and started gearing people up for how are you doing with hosting dinner parties? Who are you inviting? What does that look like? Uh, and we actually went so far as to print out a menu to kind of continue with all of the table motif of just, hey, here are some conversation topics and starters. Here are ways that you can consider if it makes sense transitioning into a faith conversation. Uh, we told people not to be over, you know, overly formulaic with it. Uh, don't push it if the opportunity is not there, but just get to know people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that worked pretty well. Um, yeah. So that way, when the time came to get to our He Gets Us series, it was a little bit easier because of what we were asking people to do. Yeah, that's really cool that you were training and equipping and put, helping them put into practice before the campaign really started. Um, was this a, when you did the training stuff, was it a, cent like, because again, you're multi-campuses, was it one central training or did you have every campus do training? Uh, both. So okay. we're the fun multi-site model where we operate centrally and autonomously. Um, so the reason all of this worked for what, us is because a lot of the times we operate separately from other campuses um, in terms of the ministry that we do week in and week out. But there are the main things that are the same, the same teaching pastor, same elder board, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so this was one of those scenarios where we worked, we call it a campaign. Some people might call it alignment, but that training series in November, all of us went through the same material. We asked our people to go through the same material. So we developed centralized training that would be run at each location as the person running the training saw fit. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so then you kick off the campaign the week after uh, uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah. How long was the campaign for and kind of how did you kick it off? Yeah, we did six weeks. So we wanted to go from the end of the Super Bowl, the weekend after, uh, and end it before Easter. So it just the calendar set it for us. Yeah. Uh, so honestly, by the time it was up and running, uh, all of the legwork ahead of time is what really mattered. We got people geared up, ready. We talked to them about all of the things we were going to be doing, and we'll get into how digital supported all of that. Uh, but we use that as a way to get people excited to say that the primary goal is you having a conversation with a friend. The secondary goal is getting you into a sermon-based small group. And then the last goal that's not even really a goal is invite your friends to church. Uh, yeah. And we did that through digital and in-person means. Okay, let's talk about it real quick, the the, the sermon-based groups. Were you encouraging your existing groups that you already had started to become sermon-based groups for that period of time? And then were you starting new groups? How did that work? All of the above, yeah. So because we wanted everybody to be on board with this, uh, we made the very big press uh, to get every group, if they were willing, to be on board. Uh, yeah. That took a lot of legwork, but we largely got there. Uh, yeah. Said it was for a short season, and we thought it was going to be for enough benefit that we got people to buy in and do that. So every one-on-one -on -one group, every small group that was existing, and every new group, we asked to do the same thing. And by and large, almost all of them did. Dang, that's awesome. That's yeah. really cool. Okay, so you have this. Okay, so now let's get into the digital element here. Um, what? How did your your digital ministry kind of help support this campaign? Yeah. So as I was thinking through this, I want to start as basic as we can get. We used our CRM. Uh, this is yeah. something where we didn't historically utilize outward as much as we utilized inward. Um, so we use a database called Rock. Uh, we're a rock show. Love to say it that way. Uh, <laughs> but ultimately, we tried to use that to get an, a good sense of our existing groups, um, the people that had expressed interest in groups. But the thing that we found a lot of success with was QR codes. Uh, those worked for a season and then they stopped working for a season. But we were able to set up our CRM to scan a QR code for every campus that went to distinct places. And it routed directly to the small group leaders that people were interested in joining their group. So we were able to cut out the middleman, saved us a lot of time. It just went straight to the group leader and say, hey, X person is interested in joining or having a conversation. Here's their information contact them, click this button when we're done. So we know that you did. Yeah. Okay. So wait, let, let me, I want to make sure I understand. So every, every group had a specific uh, QR code. No, we were able to do one overarching QR code to say you were interested in a group. Okay. And then we had a bunch of drop down menus in our registration form that connects directly to our CRM. And based on which drop down they chose, uh, it would be a specific group leader most of the time, and then it would just funnel the request that way. Yeah, that, that's great. Okay, let's go back to QR codes real quick. Yeah. I, you said something really funny. Um, they worked for a time, and then they didn't, and now they're working again. Uh, talk to me a little bit. About, again, this is just kind of a, like a side little note, but I, I, yeah. I, I think it's really interesting, your insights here. Yeah, so we had a lot of success uh, just pre-COVID and early on in COVID doing everything with a QR code. Yeah. Uh, and then once restaurants started doing it, everyone decided that they hated it. Yeah. Um, so honestly, what we found is the, the regular ongoing things, QR codes for us still work pretty well. So if we ask people to scan a QR code for a connection card, as an example, um, we're still having some success that way knowing that this was one of the main ways we were asking people to access our information, we saw a lot of success there. Uh, where we're personally not finding a lot of QR code success is like your one-off men's ministry breakfast kind of concept, something that's just a very short shelf life, um, not getting a lot of a lot of hits that way. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right on that. that. We kind of experienced something very similar. The, the really basic stuff that, that like when we're doing an, an online Bible study, we that you have to text a number, Number to this uh, or text a word to this number 
they, they'd rather just scan the QR code and go right to it. You know, there are things that QR codes work really good for, but I liked how you said that because, you know, yeah, right before COVID, in the very beginning of COVID, everyone's in the QR codes and then it, it went down. Like you go to a restaurant and it's a QR code. No, I, I want to see like a menu. I don't want to, I don't, I already look at my phone way too much. I <laughs> do not need to see it. And I have to, for a menu, I have to like pinch up for it and all that. It's like, my eyes are bad as it is. It's like, I don't need, you know, give me a menu. So yeah, I just, totally. I just think that's really cool. Okay. So you, you use QR codes for to get involved in a small group. What yeah. other digital elements did you incorporate into your series, your campaign? So as many as we possibly could, okay. uh, anything from paid ads on Facebook, uh, Google keyword searches. Uh, again, we didn't want to take the things that we might do for a holiday that we wanted to do all of that here. Yeah, uh, but I think say some of the things that we did that might be a little bit more unique um, that we saw some pretty good success with is we had a devotional guide with all of the sermon-based small group questions. Uh, that was a digital available tool to use. So we had five devos a week plus sermon-based small group questions mixed in there. So that way people could share everything with their friends if they wanted to go to coffee and just kind of work through the the concept or they could do a full-on devotional on their own or as part of a small group. We wanted to, again, eliminate as many hurdles as we could think of ahead of time to get people to own a faith conversation on their own. Mm -hmm. um, so besides doing that, uh, some of the fun things, we'll call it, that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, we, You know that I'm a big fan of pre-record. Yeah. Um, so as much as we can online still, we push for pre-recorded content. Uh, all the way to the point where our senior pastor has signed off on it. And the first five to 10 minutes of every message we do and did during this series, uh, we did a pre-record on location, almost as like a sermon illustration prop. Oh, cool. And that was shown everywhere. Uh, cool. And then we transitioned for our online audience into kind of like our online set and finished the rest of the message in there. Uh, in person, got the from stage at the end of that. So Everybody, all six campuses plus online, got the same 10-minute bit at the beginning, and then the other campuses kind of got their own detail. So I thought that was a really unique way to go about sermons in particular. Yeah. That was really fun. That, um, that's a, that is a really cool concept, a cool idea to, to do that. I've never thought about that before. It's, it's one of the things that makes us unique in a way that I think is actually really fun. Mm -hmm. uh, it ties online and in-person together pretty substantially when you go that route. And, and it really ties the other campuses together too. I mean, like not just an online campus, but like the other campuses, so they get to see a little bit of the others. So that's really cool. Yeah. Um, mixed in with that, we also decided that as much as we wanted everybody to attend a service, share a YouTube link, work through the whole service, we realized that that was pretty unrealistic. Hmm. Uh, so what we agreed upon is we were going to um, kind of do the Dave Adamson repurpose on purpose strategy. So what we did is we found clips we could use on different social media channels. Again, the 60 second clip from the service that we could share around. But beyond that, uh, we decided to take our 35 minute message and have our senior pastor re-record it into a five minute chunk. Uh, and we used that five minute chunk as a way to ask our small groups, hey, in case you weren't here for the full service, no problem. Play this five-minute video before you start working through your sermon-based small group questions so everybody can start the topic on the same page. Wow, that is really cool. And that takes a lot of buy-in for your, your senior guy to take that 35-minute message and shrink it down to five so that you can get that out to people. Yeah, we could have the greatest ideas in the world, but if our communicators weren't willing to do the extra work as well, it, it wouldn't have gone the same direction. And, and that's what I've always appreciated about how you guys do online ministry, you know, is because w with all the pre-recording that you do do, it, that's, that is a lot of extra work that you that you do, but you're tailoring it to your online group. And so that's why it's so important that what you're doing, and I love how you're now tailoring these 35-minute messages, tailoring it for those groups, whether they're online groups or in-person groups, you're really tailoring it to them so that they can be, your your group leaders can be really set up to succeed. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and the last little bit of all of just the, you know, taking the large message and condensing it down uh, is we realized 
within the last couple of years uh, that there's a growing Hispanic population in our church's footprint uh, to the point where we've launched a Spanish service at two different locations. Um, so we took our Spanish pastor and asked him to take our senior pastor's message, condense it down into the five minute as well. So that way we were still tailoring everything to the demographics that we're looking to reach. Wow, that's really cool. Again, he's taking it, modifying it, shrinking it up a little bit and tailoring it to his Spanish speaking audience. That's awesome. I mean, that because you're not making them watch an English guy share it. You're having someone speak it in their native language. That is fantastic. Yeah, we've noticed that there's a big difference between when we subtitle something or allow the platform to subtitle for us yeah. versus having a native speaker speak to our audience. And we just we found time and time again more success going that route. Um, praise God, like we have the ability to do that. Not every week, but at least, you know, for a six week chunk, we could pull all of that off and execute it still at a pretty high level. See, and again, what I like about this is that you you could have done this all in person and done all this stuff like you could have found ways to do in person type stuff. But you, you're saying we've got this digital opportunity here. The, the, the digital can really um, marry with the in person and you can use both together to really enhance, that's what I'm saying, that, that the digital can help enhance the in-person gatherings that you have together. And vice versa. In-person can enhance digital. Time and time again, we're trying to get people buy-in. We've realized that online and in-person don't cannibalize one another. They yeah. support one another and they do it really well. Yeah. Uh, and that's just, it's a hard shift to make. And I'm sure you hear that pretty regularly. Uh, yeah. But we've realized that they both support one another. If we have somebody attend a service and realize they love it, which friend are you going to pass this link along to? And then invite out for a cup of coffee to talk about it. Yeah. If you do both of those steps, you're more likely to have some success than just mass blasting. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I mean, I love this. Okay, so you did this campaign. What, what were some of the wins that you saw from their, your campaign that you guys were really excited about that came out of it? Yeah, um, I'll start with my campus and online tying together. Uh, we were able to start a women's ministry digital small group. Wow. Um, which has been really fun. Now, I'll also say my wife runs it. So maybe that's cheating a little bit. Oh. But uh, it's been a good way for busy moms to connect at our campus. And it's regularly running, you know, 10 to 15 women. They're getting together. They got together every week during the series. Uh, it was a huge success. Um, so I loved that. We yeah. we got staff and volunteers to to buy into the concept of having faith conversations, and that was the primary goal. Yeah, um, I would love to say our small group attendance skyrocketed. We had some increase. Um, I'd say by and large, most of the increase was existing people deciding to join a small group. Still a huge win, mm -hmm. uh, but mixed into it. Um, at my campus alone, there were three different groups that started up that had never met and were full of people that weren't believers in Jesus, at least at that point in time. Um, you know, we were able to tack it on to a grief share concept or in a retirement community. Mm -hmm. uh, we used the digital means to meet in-person needs and really saw some really fun things mixed out of it. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And again, it doesn't matter who's leading the group. The simple fact that you've got a group leader who's willing to do, again, I, I love online groups. Again, I, I will say this, like it, online groups are so important because they are time savers for so many people. Like, again, if you think about it, you got, you, you were just talking about busy moms. Like if you got a mom that needs to do something in person, you got to pack up all the kids, pack up all the bags, get them over there, deal with all the fussiness of things. Let's just be honest. Kids are not always perfect, but you know, what? <laughs> it's like a four or five hour ordeal of getting there and recovering from the whole thing. Whereas if you're doing an online thing, whether it's time-based or whether it's just an asynchronous group or whatnot, you're giving people an opportunity to study God's word and learn God's word together in a group setting. I, that's, that is so valuable to me. And that's why I love these online groups. It's been huge. And that's what we've heard with this particular group time and time again. If we were meeting at a Thursday night in our building, it would never happen. But when all I have to do is free up two minutes ahead of time to boot up my computer or my phone, then I'm in. Uh, and we've we've seen a lot of success because of that. 
that that, that is re- that's really cool and then who knows maybe out of that you'll be able to birth more groups from you know from that one specific group too so that's cool. great well uh, jake as we are kind of wrapping up a little bit how how would you encourage people who are listening to this whether they're you know a campus pastor or whether they're a digital online minister how would you encourage them Oh, yeah. So don't neglect online and how it can support the larger visions of your church. Uh, and maybe that's preaching to this particular audience. But we we have seen time and again that uh, they're both necessary. They both scratch an itch. Um, and we used all of it to lead to some great goals. Our in-person attendance during this campaign uh, grew by 13%. And our digital audience grew by 17%. Wow. Uh, so as you're thinking through your large scale campaigns, whether it's a capital campaign because you want to build a physical location or you just want, want to align all of your small groups for a season to go through a 40 days of faith, yeah. uh, anything in between, uh, don't just do one or the other if you have the ability. And it doesn't have to be as elaborate as we went. You set up a Zoom link and you ask people to join in is just as simple as pre-recording and having somebody edit. Yeah. Um, you can find something that can work for you that will help support the overall mission and vision of your local church. Yeah. Dang, that, that is awesome. That is very encouraging. Every time I talk with you, I get encouraged because, again, you're over in middle America. I'm on the East Coast. You know, We're an hour difference in time, but it's just so cool that you guys have stuck. You guys have said, hey, we're going to continue to invest in digital. We're going to continue to invest in in-person, but digital, now that we can meet in person and all that kind of stuff, we're not going to scrap all the great things that we've learned about digital. We're going to continue to invest in it. And I love how, again, how you marry the in-person and the digital together and they really support and enhance each other. So I, I think it's awesome. And again, you saw just great results out of um, out of your campaign. So that's really cool. Yeah. Keep refining, right? It's always a grand experiment, especially with online. It yeah. shifts, try something and then see if it works. And if it does build off of it. Yeah. I, I love it. Well, again, if you want to talk with Jake a little bit more, he's on Twitter a lot. Uh, you know, he'll be commenting on those bears and all that kind of stuff, but he does like to comment on ministry stuff as well. Um, but uh, let me ask you this. Are you on threads yet? I am not. I know I should be, but it's one of those where I just haven't put the time in. I wanted to make sure it was going to work. I got really burned with Clubhouse thinking it was going to be the next big thing. So I want to make sure it has staying power before I personally take that time to invest. Yeah, I'm on threads right now, but I just like post like once a day, just a post. Like I think it has more legs than these other other social platforms that have tried to come out. But Again, a lot of times it's like you post something or you try to talk with someone and it's like crickets, you know, so it's st- it's still got a long way to go. And and most of the people that are on there are like anti Twitter people. They're like, oh, Twitter stinks. We're here. This is this is utopia here. So, you know. <laughs> so let's be honest. Twitter does stink. And it's the greatest thing in the world all at the same time. Yes, that's what I say all the time. I, I call it a beautiful train wreck, man. It oh, is yeah. a beautiful train wreck. Yes. And again, when, whenever something newsworthy is happening, sports related, world related, I go to Twitter first because that's where, you know, I find all my information. So uh, like Jake's on Twitter. What's that? So this sounds like a whole nother conversation we could have. <laughs> it does. It, yeah. We'll have to talk about Twitter next time, because yeah. no matter how much people want Twitter to go bye bye, it's not going to go bye bye. So, we'll, you know, so. Um, well, Jake, I met you on Twitter and I'm grateful that I did. Um, and so um, thanks so much for being on the podcast as always. No problem. Thanks for having me again. All right. So other than the sports references, what stood out to you today? What encouraged you? What challenged you? What questions do you have? Definitely put in the comment section below or hit us up on Twitter. I've got Jake's Twitter handle on the show notes, mine as well. We would love to talk to you a little bit more about how you can really put digital into your church campaigns and really it goes to enhance and marries along with that today so i want to encourage you to do that today all right here's well thanks so much for being with me today as always if you enjoyed the podcast go and subscribe to it it's on youtube it's on spotify it's on apple it's on amazon it's everywhere you can get your podcast go and subscribe to it today so you can get these whenever they come out all right here's well i hope you have a great rest of your day a great rest of your week and until next time have a great one